Hey everybody and welcome into the conversation where we intend to destigmatize the conversation around cannabis and set the record straight about this powerful plant and we hope have some fun along the way. I'm your host, former CNN, NBC Sports, Fox News anchor, as well as host at Turner Sports and happen to be part of the iCannabis campaign at Cureleaf. One trend we've been all over that is helping to cut down the stigma is former athletes jumping into the cannabis industry. Right here on this show, we've talked to Megatron, Calvin Johnson, The Truth, Paul Pierce, The Glove, Gary Payton, three Hall of Famers, and a four-time Stanley Cup champ in Darren McCarty as well. All those episodes available on Pro Cannabis Media and my YouTube page as well. We'll continue those sports conversations today with the number seven pick in the 1998 NFL Draft by the New Orleans Saints. He was a pro bowler in 2001, all pro in the year 2000, started more than 100 games in nearly a decade in the NFL. Now you might know him as the front man for the Kyle Turley Band. And most importantly for these purposes, he is a cannabis business owner on several different fronts and an advocate for the industry. Kyle Turley joining us on The Conversation. Great to talk to you, brother. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, man. Great to be with you, man. It's uh, awesome what you're doing. Truly appreciate it all of everything you've been doing for this industry, man. Honestly, thank you. Cable news to cannabis was not exactly the path that I intended to follow, Kyle, but like you have seen, you just never know where life takes you. And it's more important to do what you believe in and then say the things that you believe in. So um, how would you say cannabis has changed you? Um, it, it, it didn't change me. It saved me. You know, at the end of the day, cannabis saved my life. That's what it, my message is to the world uh, and has been from day one, and it continues to be for seven years straight now. I, I don't even have to get emotional about it. It's amazing. It's, it, you know, no pharmaceuticals, not an aspirin, not an leave for over seven years straight. Um, that, that's amazing. That's a miracle. I've cured neuropathy, plantar fasciitis. I probably could have avoided three surgeries knowing what I know in cannabis now um, and how I deal with injury uh, to illness and what's going on in the world right now you know the endogenous cannabinoid system is what i discovered through cannabis saving my life and i realized that this is something that can help a lot of people so i want to come full circle back to your cannabis story um but i when i you know we all are how we're Googled today or how we're YouTube today. And you are largely becoming known more so for the cannabis business than even your NFL days, which is a real positive. But when you look back, it's still your chief YouTube, chief Google moment. It's no mystery to, to you what that is. Of course, it's the infamous. Yeah, the good hair days. Ah. Now this the is good, the, the Kyle Turk days. band. Oh, I miss it. Oh, look at it Back flowing. to music. Look at it flowing. I uh, miss that hair. <laughs> oh good you lord that guy yeah. what do you yeah. think uh, I, I i don't think you saw me I, I really missed the good hair days uh they were amazing uh got me a beautiful wife and uh i have two beautiful kids now because of it so it was awesome <laughs> and i was a lineman so who's gonna know who i was if i didn't do that right it was an amazing moment and and, and people i think appreciated more I, I mentioned darren mccarty the other day uh, on the show. And though he won four Stanley Cups, he is still every day asked about fight night at the Joe in which he delivered a <laughs> devastating blow to Claude Lemieux. That's the yeah. thing he's known for more than winning four Stanley Cups. Right. And he's come to embrace it. Yeah. Have you ever talked to Damian Robinson and laughed about that moment? <laughs> no, no, no. He still owes me $25,000. So, you know, I think he's dodging me out there and he will be forever. I'm sure. <laughs> Last time I saw him, I think I was playing for the Chiefs in my last years. And then we played a team he was on then. I don't know if it was the Rams were in the Governor's Cup or something in the preseason game. And he was there. One of my teammates pointed it out to me. And I just told I just turned and looked at him. He was talking. My buddy was talking to him. He's like, Damian Robinson, man. And I was like, you owe me $25,000, mother, you know, and went, like, just went off on him, scared the crap out of him again. It was hilarious. 
But, you know, nowadays I'm sure we'd have a great laugh. Uh, I, I, every now and then I still get to sign Jets helmets because of him and, uh, you know, the number 22, I'll never forget his jersey. <laughs> I feel a little bit bad for him because in retrospect, it's an awesome moment for you. But if I'm him, like if that's your Google yeah. moment, uh, I mean, hopefully he, he's got I don't know, you know, fame's fame, right? So I, I'm pretty sure he'll take it, you know? So, I mean, I remember watching you uh, for all those years with the Chiefs and with the Rams and with the Saints. I was surprised, though, when doing some research on you, and maybe Google has it wrong, that you played one season of high school football. Is that correct? And then went on to become an All-American? Yeah, yeah. You know, it was a, a fast, you know, happening thing, but it was a long thing in the process of development. Uh, for that to happen. I was a wrestler. I started wrestling seventh grade, all through high school, summers, everything. I loved wrestling. Um, football, though, I grew up in Southern California. I moved to Southern California when I was 10. And um, uh, I, I loved the beach when I would go visit my family. My mother's from Southern California. So we, I, I was born in Utah. I lived there for about six years on cattle ranches. My dad was a cattle rancher and a truck driver. We moved to Washington State when I was like six. We lived up in a little town called Moses Lake. Uh, hardly anybody knows about it unless you drove through it and stopped to get gas and uh, or fished at the potholes for your listeners out there. And, and we lived on a farm out in the middle of nowhere. I had to, you know, sit on the bus three hours to get home to my bus stop. And uh, it was dark every day. Um, and then we moved to Southern California and I was like, bye, I'm at the beach. And uh, I just wanted nothing more than to be in that water or be on a board skateboarding in the streets. And, you know, that summertime and football, they just didn't line up. <laughs> you know? So, so it was not about, I mean, obviously today, the reason to delay football is because of the head injuries, which we'll get into in a moment. But Brett Favre, just the other day, uh, was part of a PSA campaign suggesting kids not play football before age 14, excuse me, tackle football specifically. You're the father of a 10 and 12 year old. Do you think kids should be playing tackle football before the age of 14 or 15? I think people should uh, do what they feel is best for them and their family uh, in every situation. And if we're going to have a place like America and, you know, talk about freedom, then we need to really talk about freedom. And in that case, uh, there's a lot more to talk about because of what it truly has in store for the youth in an exposed brain injury. And why I'm in cannabis and what happened to me is been very clear that this is revolving around the brain. Um, you know, three, four years ago, I was diagnosed with stage two progressive dementia. I've been to those doctors now four times since every year consistently going back through the NFL testing protocols, and they say I'm getting better. So with a brain disease that used to put me in the hospital constantly, in and out of the emergency room with uh, seizures, um, light sensitivity off the charts, couldn't do this interview without sunglasses or a hat on from just the, my simple chandelier light. Um, this has resolved all of these things. And so my, my approach now, whereas in the beginning when I found out about CTE and the you know, true nature of it, that it is inherent in this sport. And that if you played it at any level, whether that's Pop Warner uh, to the NFL, uh, you have this disease in some fashion. I was a part of an NFL study that they completely buried. Okay? There was over 10 NFL players involved in a study that's been published on the National Institute of Health where we were injected with a serum called F18. This is real. This is a dye that lights up the brain and shows CTE in a living brain. This has been published. And I went back to try to get those records from those doctors so that I could continue to expose this truth of what is truly happening to football brains. As those doctors sat down with me face to face and told me that every one of us has it and that this is at certain stages for everybody in the world at the age of 65, this can start naturally under their study that they conducted. But everybody that's had a history of head trauma has this disease in some fashion whether it is small, it is still growing. And that can make a lot of different things happen inside of your brain. So at the youth level, to answer that question, we need to involve cannabis. I've in, you know, worked with Pylon 7 on 7, bless you. I've worked with Pylon 7 on 7 with this. They've allowed me to come and represent my CBD company at their national event in Atlanta uh, a couple of years ago, or right before COVID. Um, 
And I've been truly trying to get this message out there that cannabis needs to be included in football. If we're going to play, we're going to be free, then let's save the kids. We don't have to have these statistics where 20 kids die every year in youth football. I don't know how many kids are going to die from COVID. Uh, you know, the numbers are, you know, speculatory. And we have a vaccine, right? And we have all these things. Well, we, we, we have a brain disease that has consistently killed kids in youth football for over, uh, since Pop Warner was in, in, in created, invented. And every year it's been consistent. 20 children nearly die every year to football. 20 children on top of that are placed in wheelchairs from neurological issues, from spinal you know, issues. And then you go into the NFL with ALS and Alzheimer's and how we are 10% higher than the national average to get this disease, these diseases. So uh, my experience where I've recovered proves to me that we can still play this game. We can play it even at the youth level. We need to be smart about it. The NFL is trying to approach out with, you know, tackling techniques that always existed, uh, but cannabis must be included. I have expressed yeah. this in the NFL thoroughly. I guess what surprises me is the consensus, the thought out there is that if you delay tackle football into your teen years, your chances of getting CTE later in life are greatly reduced, but you didn't play football. You didn't play just one season of exactly. high school football. So that kind of disputes the entire notion of the narrative out there, doesn't it? Well, it should, you know, and there's a lot of other cases that say that as well. You know, to uh, Aaron Hernandez, who almost had the same story uh, and had the worst CTE known. There, we have a problem in football. It's, it's this disease. They know it. And uh, it's creating a lot of things out here that they want to make go away and just hide. Uh, you know, I don't understand why they don't want to be proactive about it. Uh, so that's why we're so loud about it. You know, I don't, I don't want to have to sit here and promote all this, my, my personal life to everybody, you know? It's imperative yeah. that I do though, because these people are intent on destroying it. So if you could describe for me, we, we talked about the 107 starts over uh, eight years in the NFL and all pro, a pro bowl season, several injuries, obviously, along the way. Can you talk about the pharmaceutical atmosphere in those locker rooms with team doctors that at least existed at the time and how they treated injuries? These things still exist today. I just coached a kid that got a full scholarship to a division one university with, uh, uh, coaches I know and everything and played for. And, and, uh, this young man has potential to be a starter at division one level for the next four years at a major university. And in spring football, he sprained his ankle severely and they gave him all kinds of pills and shot him up with cortisone for spring football. These things are still happening. Last year, the, <laughs> It's insane how the, like you you you've been there and you know how the media it, it works and it's insane for people not to know that the quarterback of the Chargers last year's lung was punctured by a cortisone injection that they were trying to mask in his ribs because he had some broken ribs he shouldn't have been out there then he should have been healed his ribs. And if he was going to put something in his body, it should be cannabis. A simple topical, if all you're trying to do is numb this individual to get out on the field, to make his brain believe that he's okay and he can do it, if that's what you believe is, yeah. is what God wants you to do with your Hippocratic oath, is puncture a young man's lung when you've choose to you know not even consider the endogenous cannabinoid system's role in this and is the number one regulatory system in the human body i've sat in front of the nfl at a meeting not too long ago where the entire medical board is in front of me and they'll probably try to exercise if you're you know i've said it a couple of times i'm now at this point i really don't care because of the nda i signed to you know not take my company away from me but you know i started my my cbd company and i did it for this great purpose and they invited me to a meeting with canopy growth and uh uh Terrell Davis was there with Defy, some, you know, a drink company. And, uh, you can go talk to Terrell if you know Terrell, get involved with Defy. That's a we drink will. company trying to take it to that level, you know. And I'm invited to this meeting and they want me to speak last. 
and I do a full PowerPoint presentation to the entire medical board of the National Football League, consisting of the chief medical officer for the United States military involving, involving neuro, uh, neurology, the brain, uh, oversaw Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, the chief uh, emergency medicine officer that oversaw Afghanistan, Iraq, and the, uh, oversees the entire United States military for emergency medicine, to uh, the chief medical officer of the NFL, Alan Sills, who is the head of neurology here at uh, Vanderbilt University down the street, uh, continues to, you know, not return my, my calls. I've called his office. I've, uh, you know, offered to come and work directly with them to show them what is, you know, possible with this. And these people thanked me in this meeting for my presentation. They said they knew what I was trying to do and that it would just take time. Well, the time's ticking and now we're masking and we're vaccinating and we are compromising this amazing thing that God created in this human body and not accessing true health and opportunity to give us the security we need as humans yeah. that existed prior that got us to where we are today, walking around the earth with 2 million viruses floating around daily. I want to touch on, on that in a sec, but I covered NFL teams and was in the Patriots locker room every day for five years. So I know what that system was like, the one you say still exists today. But can you describe for the people that haven't been in an NFL locker room what that almost candy-like atmosphere is when it comes to pharmaceutical painkillers? Well, it was. It was candy for sure. You, you nailed it with the, the word there with that analogy. Uh, and the Saints got busted for it after I, I was done with my career because they finally found the candy jar. And they're like, wait a minute, that's Vicodin in there? Whoa. That, now I've heard Vicodin's bad all of a sudden, finally, after these doctors, everybody have been just doling it out to everybody freely at the drive through window at Walgreens like candy. And that's how it was in the NFL. I don't think the NFL is any different than our communities where we are suffering. 115 people are going to die today from prescribed opiate use, not from overdose of, you know, being a junkie. 115, 115 people statistically will die today, this day. When your interview's done and if people watch this, if it goes up live or today, it's 115 people are dying because of a prescribed opiate use. That, that has to end. This is not a, a, a situation where, you know, we are any different. It, it, it was just at a, a, another level. You know, you get to the, you have a chartered plane after a away game, you get on and there's two beers in the back seat of the, the, or the, the, the pocket of the back the seat of the seat in front of you. And the trainers were walking down the aisles, handing out muscle relaxers, painkillers, anti-inflammatories. What do you need? What do you need? What do you need? Down the aisles. That's how it was. It, it was, a, we didn't go see the doctor. When I got my concussion in St. Louis, in fact, uh, I went to the emergency room because my wife took me there. They gave me to her fully concussed. They knew it terrified she finds a police officer at uh, ram stadium st louis and he's everybody's weird, freaked out when my my wife bringing me to them i don't remember any of it and they take me to the emergency room at the hospital which the ram should have done because they i was unconscious on the field they woke me up with the ammonia caps um and uh, you know hour an hour and a half two hours later i'm finally getting to the hospital they freaked out. They did a brain scan immediately, freaked out the whole neurology unit in the hospital up there in St. Louis. And then uh, the next day, the Rams pulled me out of there. Uh, and I never saw those or doctors or talked to them again. They, they, and they never, I never spoke to those people again. And there was, people were frantic until I came to Tennessee and retired. And the same scenario happened, luckily, uh, <laughs> I can say now. Uh, because it verified everything that, you know, is going on. I, for one, will never forget a, a conversation I had with Hall of Famer Jason Taylor about the Tordal shots that got him out there on the football oh, yeah. field. Yeah, Tordal, the locker room, Tordal ever on the sideline. lost from my mind. Yeah, I mean, yeah. the thing. I took three Tordal injections in my hip on the sideline because it wouldn't stop hurting. I got a huge hip pointer. There was like a fumble or something, and I tackled this dude and lit him up. And you know, I was running like full speed out of like a 30-yard start to just tee off. And I, my hip and flying through the air just slammed into him or hit another guy. And if you ever had a hip pointer, it's like, oh, just crippling. And I couldn't walk. 
And they, it's, this was an injury that's just contusional. You know, it, it's a contusion. It'll, it'll heal with just get an ice tub, ice, you know, settle down. No, I'm on the sideline. They're ejecting me with cortisone three different times in my side and my hip. Shoot it up, shoot it up. I got to get back out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gotcha. <laughs> so, so why then, Kyle, with, with all that, that pharmaceutical atmosphere that exists and the Toradol shots and, and the pain pills like candy dishes and the NFL knows what cannabis can do and they, are, they have come a long way in their evolution, but why, when they know the science, when they know what it can do for players, what has taken the NFL so long to come along in supporting the health of its own players? Well, it's a government agency at this point. I mean, it's pretty clear. Um, you know, they're mandating vaccines to the players. They are uh, mandating testing if you refuse. Um, yeah, but that's to masks. keep them safe, man. That, I mean, yes, whether or not you safe. agree with vaccination. I, I love that. I love that because before games, every year for my 10-year career, prior to this, what did we not know about the human body that we don't know now? Oh, that, that viruses can make you sick and give you the sniffles and put you down for a couple of weeks and you might come out and you're likely to come out of it. Wow. We've known that for thousands of years. They used to uh, tell us in the NFL, if you don't get the flu shot and you get the flu, we're going to find you if you miss practice, if you miss games. If you're in. So we were, no, I was a guy who was taking the flu shot. You know, and that would make me sick every year. And would they put me down and allow me to be sick and put a guy in my place because and like take me away from the team? No, they're giving me fluids, in, uh, IVs, injections before the games, half times, everything. Right. But but why, in your estimation, won't the NFL come further on cannabis when to your point they are mandating vaccines? And I think that is a very good thing. Now, honestly, that is about making money. They want the ratings to stay high. They want people in the seats and they want stars on the field. But that's the same yeah. case when it comes to, to, to cannabis, isn't it? So why are they taking so long? Uh, it's, I don't know. It's the same thing. Again, you're, you're talking about cannabis uh, and what, why they're taking so long is why the United States medical community is taking so long. You still don't have the endogenous cannabinoid system talked about or studied in colleges. You know, this is not a part of the, the United States Medical uh, Board uh, that they acknowledge the endogenous cannabinoid system. It is the number one regulatory system in the human body, and they all know it, and they are intentionally not allowing us to know this. This is what's happening. I don't know, you know, what your conspiracy threshold is, you know, <laughs> at this point, though, I, I'm pretty sure everybody can sit there and say something's going on. And if you listen to people who know what's going on and know what is happening here and understand reality, okay, why would you vax your body for a 99.9% .9 survivable virus? Do you know how many viruses are sitting out there? Two million plus viruses floating around in the sky daily that we've been able to fight through to get to where we are today. We are being denied the endogenous cannabinoid system's ability to resolve all of this. And that is, I think, you know, in ways part of it because it doesn't make any sense. The science is there, the studies are there, and they continue to ignore these things. You know, now the NFL is saying they're going to give a million dollars to studies out there for cannabis because they need more proof. Rafael Mishulam, who I met personally and sat down with and spoke to face to face, has been funded by the National Institute of Health for over 50 years on his research in cannabis in Israel. The, the Israeli army is prescribed cannabis in the field. They allow their military to smoke marijuana in the battlefield on duty. The, this is a medicine in pharmacies in Israel. We back Israel, we talk about Israel, we support Israel, we've allowed our country to be taken over by Israel in many ways because it controls our politics, it, does it not? Every politician talks about Israel, everyone. When are we gonna stop talking about Israel and we're gonna start understanding Israel so that we can resolve these things in our lives and be America, okay? Why is Jimmy Carter going to Israel to cure his cancer? Why? Because they know. They know. And it's okay with them. So it should be allowed for us to contribute to this world and allow truth to be told so that we can move forward and not continue to regress.
we could have a whole nother conversation about his real <laughs> U.S. politics. And, you know, uh, my background allows me to do so. But let's let's stay on the subject. So you mentioned early onset Alzheimer's, CTE symptomatic. You've had seizures, vertigo. What was your aha moment that cannabis could change your life or, in fact, as you say, save it? Um, you know, I was just at a loss, uh, at the end of the day, I was in Tennessee post career moved here, uh, cause I'm back here now because of my kids, I'm putting them in real schools. that are not masked and they don't have to get a vaccine and they're in school and they're learning and they're having fun and driving with other kids and nobody's dying and nobody's sick. It's ridiculous. But, uh, for me, it was sitting on my couch, pilled out, out of my mind, going in and out of rehab centers, meeting with psychologists, neurologists, uh, neuropsychologists, going through all of this, trying to figure out what was going on with me and then understanding what was going on with me once I discovered CTE. That put me on this quest. My entire life has been this quest to understand who I am. And for me now, it's the opportunity I have to give back because cannabis truly saved my life through sitting on my couch, watching a TV commercial saying, if you've been a part of this drug and uh, this happened to you and that happened to you and that happened to you, you can be a part of this lawsuit. And I just sat there and was like, my God, I am, uh, there's 12 reasons, 12 bottles on my counter that are going to put me in one of these commercials having to, you know, just suffer through life if I make it because I was suicidal, homicidal, uh, ruining everyone's life around me and my own. And uh, it didn't make any sense. I'm money and everything in, in my life that anybody out there would put on as a dream life, you know, fame, all these things. Uh, and, and, and I was lost. And it wasn't until I got lost, I asked God to help me. And this answer was given to me. I got down on my knees and I prayed and I said, I need some help. And that from that moment of uh, giving in to saying, you know what, I need help spark this this realization in my mind watching this commercial uh that told me i have yet to give one opportunity to the the, the true opportunity to one thing that i've known because canvas was introduced to me and i knew it always is something that helped something that helped i even called the suicide hotline one time and the the person on the other end asked me about all the medications i was taking and then they, they, they uh, I told them, I, you know, they asked if I did anything else. And I said, I smoke a little cannabis, you know, at the same time, just to ease everything at night so I can sleep and eat and do those things. And they said, keep doing that. That's the thing that's going to help you. And, you know, I don't know why that person told me that to then go in California and have that experience of, uh, you know, a, a, a true divine intervention where I, I, realize in my brain uh, that that I've not given this one thing I've known about since I tried it, uh, you know, and just used randomly. Uh, Were you really considering suicide? Were you close? Constantly. This is not a, this is not, this is a part of this disease. It is very real and it can go to those places. Um, th these things, uh, it, you know, in the neurology of it, if you want to go to the science, the frontal lobe being compromised, and the entire brain as this disease massetizes, grows around it and continues to, uh, you know, cover my brain as it does everybody else's and all the brains they've opened up from all the guys that have, you know, gone crazy. We don't just have OJ Simpson as a murderer. We have murderers in prison across this country that played in the NFL. Um, on the other hand, we have some good news. You mentioned the pain study, and, and I think it is a step in the right direction. The fact that the NFL no longer suspends players for positive tests, and they have even raised the threshold considerably. Clearly, they want no part of suspending players for cannabis use, unless it's a Josh Gordon-like situation, which is a whole nother uh, issue. Calvin Johnson, the first guest on this program, spoke about cannabis on the Hall of Fame stage, which I thought was a game-changing moment for the industry. Did you hear that speech? And what do you think it could mean to have that platform? Oh, it was amazing. You know, it was awesome to hear him get up there and stand for holistic medicine. You know, I mean, we're not just talking about cannabis. You know, now cannabis has uh, opened the door to the poli uh, you know, conversation and, and other opportunities in, in plant-based medicine. Um, and plant-based medicine, as it turns out, is, is far more effective 
than um, you know conventional Western medicine. And now, it, you know, if you if you truly care to use your smartphone, you can find out that the heads of these companies. Um, if you're interested to know these things and what you're putting in your body, instead of just being a, a, a drone in the drive through, you know, handing out, give me my bag, give me my bag of pills, give me my bag of pills, you, you can get your life back. I mean, at the end of the day, isn't that what you're trying to do? And it's unfortunate that the medical community preys upon people. Uh, these, these resolutions in plant-based medicine are real, you know, and then we still haven't tapped in to what's inside of us and we're not being allowed to access stem cells where, uh, I mean, I've got some veteran friends that were blown up, burned up and, you know, uh, these incidents and they are just screaming at the top of their lungs about the stem cell uh, uh, experience they're having and how it's regenerating skin growth and nerves and everything else. And these guys are back in the gym and they're lifting weight. You know, I'm doing the same thing. I've empowered my cannabinoid system and that's what it's about. And every one of these guys, you know, is using cannabis and now we're getting into all the other things. It's amazing. We, we keep using the word cannabis, but for most people, it's still marijuana. How important do you think the terminology is? And I don't know why it is. I, I talked to a, a doctor who has a PhD who said, I used to study the negative impacts of marijuana. Now I study the positive impacts of cannabis. Do we need to get rid of the term, the word marijuana? Why? Are we, is that, I mean, that's pretty racist at the end of the that's day. That's the stigma, right? <laughs> That, Mar but Mar that's Marijuana the stigma is, uh, you know, simple Espanol, you know, but you we, know, as well gonna... as I do with yeah. the term marijuana comes a stigma. I know for 100%. some reason with the word cannabis there, there does not. Uh, the trains left the station at the end of the day. I'm tired of, you know, sitting here and saying, how are we going to palette this for people to listen to? You know, people are posting things on my comments about the truth. I'm not saying don't take the vaccine. You can take it if you want, but people shouldn't be forced to. You can wear a mask if you want, but I shouldn't be forced to. I understand my health. I understand I haven't been sick in over six years. I understand the power of the endogenous cannabinoid system and how it protects me as I empower it every day. It puts my uh, it, it, you know, body into homeostasis. These are scientific facts. These are not fictional me pulling this out of the air. So if a doctor wants to talk about this, an official wants to talk about this, you know, I have the answer for them and why I can defend myself in any stance of being a, a, a man, a human and understanding human health. Uh, so we, we have to move past these stigmas, these semantics, you know, um, of caring about what an ignorant mind believes, because if an ignorant mind is going to be swayed upon a word that is simply just a uh, foreign language to them, uh, it means the same thing, um, then, then oh, where are we going to get? We're, we're not going to get anywhere. Um, and we're going to be back where we were in the you know, past the 60s uh, and where they then just took the 70s to <laughs> go on a worldwide rampage around America. You know, the 60s provided mm -hmm. individuals like Jack Carrere, um, Old Ed Holloway, all these guys who were veterans that fought for this plant. And then the industry itself put a, a slam door on, on their voices in many ways because they were trying to, you know, let's let's. Talk sure. to these people about how they want us to, to give it to them. You know, that's why I started these brands. I got this brand, Revenant, uh, that we started. I got Ricky Williams and Jim McMahon. Don't skip by it. Britain. Tell me about uh, Revenant. Yeah, Revenant, the word, back to life, back from the dead. Is and what that's a strain. Experience. Yeah, we've got, <laughs> right now we've started out with three different strains. We've got uh, XJ13. XJ13 is a sativa hybrid that is amazing. It's how does Revenant strain. How does Revenant differ from the other products out there? Um, in that we're focusing on this as a medicine, and that the things we've experienced has changed our lives. And you know, from smoking to uh, the flower, however you want to use it, you want to eat it, you want to smoke it, we're going to give it to you in every which way we can because. Uh, the things that we've found, I mean, we've got things down to the gift, which is 1% uh, THC, okay? But look at the CBD count in this. This is over 15% CBD in a pre-roll that is made from trim. Th this is, this is, these are who we work with, these providers who are producing premium medicinal products, allow people an opportunity to experience cannabis without this, this you know, put you on the couch high. And if they listen to our stories, 
then they're going to try these products and maybe it'll work for them like it works for us. And if it doesn't, then that's why we presented it in these ways that we are, because this is mine yep. and that's Evans and this is Jim's. And, you know, we're continuing to expose the things that we've found that work for us and what we believe will help everybody out there. Do you want to see federal legalization and how quickly do you think it can happen? hundred percent. And it has to happen. It will happen. It's happening. You know, I mean, Schumer just got up there uh, with the finance and, you know, Booker and the social justice crew. Uh, they're going to now finally come together because they made their deal backstage in the cloak room. And, uh, you know, now they're going to present it to people, you know, uh, because you can't have one without the other. Right. They can't exist. You're going to have disruption in this person bad at that person. You know, it's unfortunate that they don't put this down the middle of the road that it should be as a, a human health issue. This is not a state's rights issue. This is not a partisan issue. This is a human health issue. Cannabis should be free and legal and available to every human on this planet. It speaks to our endogenous cannabinoid system and we yeah. need it. It is, I'll it tell is you though, a part of us. I have long been a proponent, obviously, of legalization. I have evolved in that though and that is because people like you my fear is with federal legalization amazon in one word um i like that there's five ten maybe even more years for businesses like revenant to grow and to have some runway and to get to establish themselves whereas the federal legalization were to come along right now you and i both know what would happen whether that's Amazon or not, it is clearly big pharma and maybe a few players like Cureleaf could come in and wipe out thousands of businesses across the country in one fell swoop. Is that not a concern you have? No, because those people huh. at the top, if it, they're eliminating the individuals that help get them there, they're never going to succeed. And a guy in his garage or a little house down the street or your neighbor kid in his closet is growing better weed than those people, okay? So at the end of the day, the industry and the growers set the standard. This plant is amazing. And those who know it are the only ones who can produce it. These people, I've been around this now in this conversation, all these people think they're gonna do this and think they're gonna do that. And at the end of the day, this is God's plant. And God's gonna do with it as he will. And the people are the ones who are gonna bring it to us. And that's what's happening big corporations all these people are trying to get in the game but those guys are those are those are part of those guys i have that i've met they're all cool <laughs> you know bo wrigley bo wrigley's getting in the game he's came, yep, come out and right. said he took the ceo of patron uh he started his company now he's doing you got jimmy buffett on board he's got the endless summer he's got all these things going on dude i, I hung out with that dude down in in, in baja man and uh, he let me jump off the top of his yacht you know, a hundred foot yacht uh, uh, from the bottom of the sea, maybe 200, maybe hundred feet off the top of his yacht. That's a 400 foot <laughs> yacht. And uh, all right, that I need to try. Had breakfast on his yacht. He came to my restaurant. We hung out. Uh, uh, he invited me to breakfast the next day with my family and his, you know, we had breakfast. So you, you don't fear uh, no. big corporate, big pharma. I, I do, but, but that is, um, no, I, I, I met these guys, uh, the guys that are in it are, are guys. There are people out there that are going to definitely try to get in it. And, uh, you know, those people are going to fail at the end of the day. They, they, they won't have the power, uh, to, I mean, look at the X Games, okay? We can take you to a sports conversation, all right? Did the, did, did the, the Olympic Committee increase the allowance of THC and go into the Shikari Richardson thing? Did they, did they increase the level of THC to over 152 nanograms from 35? For any other reason other than the X Games, because the dates line up, and then uh, the guys in the, that are playing these things, I know personally, the guys that are on snowboards and, and, yeah. and you know, snowmobiles and all these things, they all smoke weed, every one of them. These guys are not gonna give it up, not even close, because how else are they giving the opportunity to focus their mind and create these visions of jumping and flipping over mountains and creating all these things? This, this is involving us a, a 
part of the brain that accesses that, that the majority of people out here can't even fathom, okay? Uh, they weren't gonna give up their cannabis. And so they needed to put that level as high as possible so that they knew nobody would test. That's why I think that yeah. this Sakari Richardson thing is a bunch of crap, it's a big political stunt because they still haven't come out and said what she tested positive at. Ricky Williams told me he tested positive at 19 nanograms. The NFL at the time was 15. He said, I had no idea. That I didn't think I was going to test positive, Kyle. Otherwise, I wouldn't have taken the test. I, I know I could pass those, and I didn't think I would uh, fail. I personally thought Shakari Richardson could have been a major moment for change. I thought she failed in that regard, not just losing that race the other day, but I thought failing to take advantage of the moment, the, the interviews on the Today Show with the whole world watching to say, this rule yeah. sucks. It yeah. makes no sense. This is not performance enhancing. It does not violate the spirit of sport. The, the exact WADA rule contradicts itself. It makes no sense. I thought she really failed to take advantage of the moment. 100%, you know, and I just, I don't think that's, you know, by her doing. I, I don't think that's her doing. I think she's being given a lot of bad information and uh, now in, a, in, a, in the care of uh, people who are giving her this bad information, unfortunately, because you look at the athletes that have uh, use cannabis in sports, especially in the Olympics, and you can count seven gold medals around uh, a certain swimmer. You can count all those gold medals around a certain sprinter. Uh, you can count all the gold medals in all these sports around the world from all these people who understand this plant. It helps. Yeah. Uh, it works. And it is, you know, not a performance enhancer, like you said. They, they need to expose the science. You know, it's truly unfortunate. Again, you have governing bodies that are supposed to be educated on science that don't understand it at all. The endogenous cannabinoid system is being denied accessibility by athletes. We, 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 it is an, the, the United States government owns a patent on cannabinoids as anti-inflammatory antioxidants and neuroprotectants. There, mm -hmm. There's no other neuroprotectant patent on, in the world on any other substance. Like that's real. There's no one thing out there. You, not one person has ever proved it that there's another thing out there that the United States government or any medical institution or governing body, uh, uh, university group, or anybody has filed a patent on a substance as a neuroprotectant. There's only one that exists, cannabinoids. Interesting point on that. I, I want to, about out of time, but I want to get your thoughts on the conversation parents like myself and yourself are going to have to have with their kids about cannabis. And it's one you have had. Um, I had a photo shoot the other day for Cureleaf and my son said, well, that's weird. What, why would Cureleaf be here? And I, I, I was stuck in a moment, like not ready to talk to my kids about sex type of moment. How did you have a conversation with your kids about marijuana and what should we say to them? Uh, you know, for me, it's just about I'm here. You know, my, my kids uh, have seen a lot of things uh, that they shouldn't, you know, um, and they still do because of this brain disease and, um, you know, dealing with all these issues from all the orthopedic pain and everything to try and deal with this world's not easy. Uh, and so my kids have seen the alternative. They saw me pilled out. They saw me a zombie on all these drugs. And they've seen the difference since cannabis came into my life. And I've been able to use it to get back to being me. Um, in some ways, that's good. In some ways, that's bad. Uh, but I, I continue to be here. And, and uh, when my community and all my friends are, you know, I'm losing them all, all the time. I mean, so many guys are, are continuing to fall that, uh, you know, these are not stories that are, you know, where I can personally put them off or my kids and my family can say, oh man, that's just one in a million. No, these are all of our friends. You know, these are all of our people. My son knows all of these people. So when I talk to him and I talk to my daughter or my wife or anybody, uh, I'm quite open with where I was and where I'm at. And at the end of the day, that's what people need to do. If cannabis is benefiting you, you need to tell people about, it. you need to tell your kids why. You know, my son, I, I, I found tremendous benefit from smoking cannabis. And my son's like, why are you smoking dad? I'm like, I would, you know, wish I didn't have to, honestly, you know, I enjoy it. I, I want to smoke, you know, cannabis all the time. The, the, there are negative effects to that, you know, with the, the smoke and the smell. But and, you don't think you know, kids should have it before the age of 18 or are you okay with it? Yeah, 100%. They need it. Uh, the endogenous cannabinoid system is, 
why would you deny your child the opportunity for its body and developing immune system, brain, and everything? Are we else, talking CBD or THC? CBD isolate. With zero THC, I started my CBD company, NeuroXPF. You go to neuroxpf.com. It is strictly isolate, triple tested. We extract three different times to make sure that all THCs out of these products is only CBD. And you can give this to kids. It is very beneficial for them. It will help them. It can save their life in head injury situations. The studies out of UCLA Medical School years ago uh, can be done and replicated across this country at the emergency rooms and understanding the ICU units of, of records of head injuries and traumatic brain injury. And those that use cannabis across the board and every study ever done that have been brought into these hospitals, over 80% of them live and don't go into comas and don't have to have brain surgeries versus wow. a contrasting equal of those who don't test for cannabis in their system, that they go into comas, have to have brain surgeries and or die. The exact 80%, 180%, 180 degree uh, turnaround, uh, it, right down the line, it's there. The evidence is there. So for my kids, I tell them, I need to do this. I'm here and we're just gonna keep doing it. <laughs> you see where it goes. You know, I, 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 I was backstage with Bennett Omalu who Will Smith played in the movie Concussion. That's right. And, uh, you know, he told me, Kyle, I see it in you. Keep smoking it. That's what Bennett Omalu, the lead guy and brains around the world who discovered CTE, told me backstage at a show called The Doctors, which I've been on talking about cannabis. And I've been on Dr. Phil and I've talked to all these people and they, it changes their mind. And they're all, you know, going at the end of it going, wow, I just got kind of schooled by a guy who doesn't have a degree from San Diego state and is, you know, ironically spoke at Harvard twice and continues to go around saying these crazy things. Maybe I should listen to him. Hopefully we get more people to do that. I hope we do. We agree on cannabis. We also agree on country music, which you sing. Uh, one of my favorite country cannabis songs and there are more and more though i think you know willie nelson obviously really started the game but here's a great one that i love from chris stapleton I might as well get stoned. Yeah, man. Love that song. Um, oh, yeah. Can you sing me a few, a few cannabis chords before we go? A you few cannabis I mean, chords. I know, I know you have the song High. I don't know yeah. if that is the best one, but uh, is there anything <laughs> you, 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 you Sure. Hold on. Let me get this uh, guitar here real quick. <laughs> oh, see, this is how we do it on the There we go. There we go. I told you to bring the guitar. All right, let's do it. <laughs> let's see. Let's see if I can get it. There we go. We gotta drop it. I had to drop it down a little bit to D. I say hi. That's good. That's good. That's good. That's perfect, man. That's every bit that I needed. That was <laughs> that was amazing. I, I, I love it. Great job. Yeah, I'm sure it sounded amazing. I'm sure it sounded like crap with this guitar, but there's no, a that little, was little ditty. I'm working brother. on a bunch of new music, uh, and uh, we'll see where that goes, you know? All right, where Get can we find it? Uh, you can go to kyleturley.com. I think that's still up. That's my music. Or you can go get it on anywhere. I mean, you go to Pandora or anything, punch in Kyle Turley on your station. And uh, it'll, it's a cool station. A uh, lot, lot of cool Southern rock and uh, country on it um, with some uh, rock. So the Pandora people hooked me up on that one. That's been pretty sweet to listen to. And uh, if you're ever in any of those uh, bars or anything with the pay-to-play jukebox deals that are electronic digital deals, you can bring my name up and, 
you know, I'm out there. It was a while. I was touring around the country with everybody in music and um, Williams included. It, it was awesome. That was a great experience. And then I just had to put it on the shelf because of my health and, you know, gotten that back, you know, to a level where I'm, I'm going to try to hit it again. We'll see what happens. Awesome, brother. Great to talk to you, Kyle Turley. Check out the uh, Revenant Strain. Check out NeuroXPF. And I'm right now on Pandora, going to jam to the Kyle Turley station here when we're done. Great to talk to you, brother. Best of luck down the road. Keep us posted. Thank you much. I appreciate you, brother. Stay high, stay alive, and uh, keep fighting, man. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you.